Amphenol Broadband Solutions is a global leader in the manufacture and engineering of interconnect RF and optical products, as well as solutions across the entire spectrum of broadband network topologies, including wireless, copper, fiber, and satellite. Headquartered in Wallingford, Connecticut, ABS is a division of Amphenol Corporation, a Fortune 500 company with a nearly 100-year history as a leading diversified interconnect manufacturer. While Amphenol Corporation supports nearly every major global industry, Amphenol Broadband Solutions supports advanced communication networks by providing critical technology to over 200 service providers in 40 countries. With strategic manufacturing and distribution locations around the world, including facilities in North America, Europe, Asia, and Latin America, Amphenol Broadband Solutions offers hardware, design, and inventory management solutions, along with multi-level training and deployment programs. Our worldwide footprint allows the flexibility to support customers in today's constantly changing environment. Recently, the broadband industry has dealt with trade wars, political instability, and a global health crisis, while providing essential communication services for schools, distance learning, hospitals, essential services, and the explosion of a workforce telecommuting from home. Amphenol Broadband Solutions Footprint gives us the agility to adapt and ensures that we continue to innovate and supply the world service providers, as well as their end users. At ABS, we remain laser focused on continuing new product development, coupled with strategic acquisitions, to offer complete end-to-end -end innovative solutions that cover inside plant through to demarcation, whether using RF, optical, or wireless technology. Amphenol Broadband Solutions is pleased to contribute to the convergence of access networks, both with our products and through our sponsorship of this educational track. Good morning, all. The entire cable industry are very excited to be here today. I'm Craig Cowden. Uh, I'm the SVP of Wireless Technology at Charter. I've uh, been very involved in, in the planning of this effort and particularly excited about this workshop. I think we've got a great panel, and it's on a topic that I think is uh, uh, interesting to a lot of different constituents. It's really on the, the, the state of converging access in 5G mobile networks. Uh, a lot of good thinking, a lot of good ideas uh, on this panel, uh, and, and I'm excited to, uh, to moderate and to introduce it. Just a couple of logistics. I really encourage questions. Uh, in the Slido uh, app uh, as, as you go through the presentations or as you listen to the presentations. I also encourage if you see a good question to like it and so that'll get pushed up to the top uh, and, and we'll get some attention uh, on that. I, I would also ask if, if there's a, a specific panelist that you'd like to direct your question to uh, to indicate that in, in the question itself. So let me get to fixed mobile convergence uh, or mobile convergence in general. It's a topic that has been around for a long time, uh, multiple years, uh, really more than a decade in terms of the general thought of, of how uh, different networks could be converged. Uh, I think in the past, as, as people claim fixed mobile convergence, it really was disparate networks and they tried to bring them together really more as a marketing benefit, uh, maybe as a bundling play. But as we look forward, and really over the last couple of years and going forward, I think it'll be more of a truly integrated uh, uh, convergence outcome. And uh, that's exactly what we're going to focus on uh, with this panel today. You know, if you think about the industries that we're in, the broadband internet industry and the mobile industry, they're disparate today, at least in the United States. Uh, however, uh, the distinctions between those industries are beginning to blur. And if you think about 10 years out, five years out, uh, they could completely blur, where instead of a mobile industry or a broadband internet industry, it's a connectivity industry anywhere uh, internet connectivity, whether you're in the home or on the road. And I think that's essentially uh, what we're trying to uh, explore with this panel today. So we've got some great guests, uh, great panelists. We're going to start off with Jennifer uh, Andrioli Fang from Cable Labs. I've worked with Jennifer for a long time. Uh, she's got a very interesting deck on, on the state of convergence uh, across the industry, including major MSOs in North America and Europe. Uh, next speaker uh, will come right in, John Chapman. I'm sure many of you know John. I've also worked with John for a very long time. He's got a very interesting traffic, engine, uh, traffic engineering formula 
uh, specifically for small cells and how small cells will be deployed uh, in, into uh, MSO networks. And then next we have Elias uh, Chavaria Reyes. He's going to explain what's going on with DTP, DOCSIS timing protocol, which is essential in terms of timing and synchronization of using DOCSIS networks for, uh, uh, for uh, mobile outcomes. And then finally, Bill Beasley is going to bring it home uh, with a look at the future of wireless transport. He uh, brings together multiple technology protocols that are essential to enable uh, this ultimate uh, fixed mobile convergence outcome. And so let me get right to it. We've got a lot of content, four speakers. Uh, I'm going to start off again with uh, uh, Dr. Jennifer Andrea Fang. She's a distinguished technologist at Cable Labs, over 20 years of experience in the development of state-of-the-art broadband technologies. She's recognized as a DOCSIS and mobile wireless thought leader. That is exactly accurate. That's exactly how I think of her. Jennifer spearheaded many highly impactful projects, including the development of DOCSIS 3.0, 3.1, uh, full duplex DOCSIS, uh, including Max Specs. More recently, she co-invented uh, Low Latency Crosshaul, LLX, and has been leading cable and mobile convergence. Jennifer's efforts have been critical to the success of the cable industry, and I'm excited that she's working on this particular project. Jennifer, take it away. Thank you very much, Craig. Uh, let me go ahead and advance the slide. There we go. Um, really, really excited to be here and really thankful to be here today. We've had an amazing pleasure to interview six operators and uh, what their plans are for mobile and convergence. We've also had the pleasure of working with two CTOs and uh, distinguished uh, technologists, I mean, distinguished engineer at Cisco to get their take on the convergence architecture and technologies. So in the next 20 minutes, I want to take you around the world to get to know each operator, their mobile st uh, story, their pioneering work on cable and mobile convergence. Okay, so if you look around the world, <clears throat> we already have convergence of the operator. We find that the majority of operators are already converged operators. And with the United States being, being an exception, but it's quickly catching on. And let's begin our trip around the world, starting right here at the United States. Okay, there we go, United States. And you know, as we can see that we've got coast to coast coverage from a variety of operators. Okay, so um, for each operator, um, we'll talk about their current plan, what, what their current plan is, their vision and technology focus. Um, so we'll start with charter. Um, before we start though, let's, let's explain some terminologies. MNO, what is MNO? Well, MNO uh, is a mobile network operator that owns their mobile network. Um, MVNO, mobile virtual network operator is a virtual operator. They rent mobile from someone else and resell the business and they optimize. Um, so this is the model where many cable operators um, are starting out in mobile. And third, and a new category is a hybrid MNO, uh, which does both. So in some footprint, uh, you can build out the wireless network where it makes sense and then rent in some other footprint. And it can be based on spectrum choices as well, right? So MNO for, for example, CBRS band and MVNO for LTE. And Charter here is a great example of MVNO, a, a virtual operator moving to a hybrid model. So as a virtual operator, you're renting airtime. And so to reduce that rent cost, to reduce, uh, you need to reduce the airtime you rent. And so you want to use your only airtime. And for Charter's case, that is Wi-Fi. So, so the first and obvious optimization is to offload as much traffic as possible to the Wi-Fi network. But let me tell you, it's, it's harder than it sounds. Um, you need to have a working set of credentials and a mechanism that can switch between Wi-Fi and LTE quickly. Uh, and back and forth. Okay, so where else can you save money? Um, one way is to, uh, is to connect the small cells to the HFC plant. And you might need as many as 25 to 100 small cells for each fiber node. So rather than pulling new fiber, using the existing DOCSIS plant to reduce CapEx and accelerates the time to market. And here, another technology here that is really worth knowing about Charter is the dual SIM, dual standby. They did a lot of great work on this. 
And what it is is that look at your SIM card. The SIM card is a physical piece of uh, hardware that, that gives you an identity. And dual SIM basically uses one hardware card and plus a second SIM that is in the software. So it's a two SIM, one radio solution. And that allows you to connect the two, to two networks without having to power two radios. Okay, so let's move down south to our friends at Cox. And what is important to know about Cox is that they're really providing uh, backhaul over their HFC plant already today as a service to other mobile operators. And it just works. Um, so, but what you notice about Cox is that with this recent CBRS auction, Cox is likely going to become the newest member of the MBNO club. Uh, they're also looking at how to use this wireless network to enable the IoT services. And really the IoT, we believe that is the next frontier where you know, rather than connecting just people, uh, IoT lets you, to, uh, lets you put sensor on everything and you're connecting everything um, and everything on the HFC network. And for Cox, another mobile opportunity is to use the mobile network to extend their HFC footprint. And this is often referred to as the fixed wireless access, F FWA. And FWA is often the first step to do that, uh, which may or may not uh, be followed up with, uh, with fiber. Let's move up north to uh, the, the, the great white north, our friendly neighbor in Canada, um, and, and see what those guys are up to. And here in Canada, uh, most cable operators are already mobile operators. Okay, let's start with Shaw. Shaw Communications is a dominant player in Western Canada. And in the last few years, they purchased Wind, which was then rebranded to Freedom Mobile and, and which is now Shaw Mobile. And so now Shaw Communications is a solid, solid uh, mobile player. Um, they're a big believer in Wi-Fi offload, as with uh, most of our operators in the United States. And Shaw has also, what's amazing about their um, deployment is that they've also deployed small cell software in the HFC plant, and they've proven the business model to be dramatically different, I mean, better than fiber. So Damien, uh, Damien Pauls, um, a uh, senior VP at Shaw, he done some analysis and it was published. Uh, we discussed this in one of the Cable Labs summer conferences uh, last year. And, and what he showed is that the HFC backhaul is 1% of the cost of fiber. Well, 20, uh, 20 times faster time to market compared to fiber. And Shaw is also really focused on the new technologies developed right here at Cable Labs. Um, LLX for, low, uh, for latency, low latency X-Hall and network timing to the HFC plant. And as a, uh, a sort of kind of a regional operator, another thing to be aware of is, uh, is the inter-operator handover. I mean, so, so here's the thing, um, roaming, we all know roaming, what roaming is. We land in a new country, we'll go roam to somebody else's network, right? But the analogy here is that instead of changing networks when you enter and leave a country, imagine that you have to enter and leave the, uh, leave the network when you walk down the street. So the challenge here is really just, is how to keep a call up when the user jumps between the networks in real time. Okay, so let's move uh, east, uh, Videotron. Videotron is the dominant player in Quebec, and uh, which is predominantly French speaking. And Videotron is already a mobile operator. As a well-established mobile operator, one challenge that they will face is how to migrate from their uh, 4G network to 5G. And that's a big deal because, when, uh, because that involves uh, the questions such as like, when do you buy new equipment? Um, where do you deploy? Do you, do you deploy two networks? Do you build two networks? And, and there's potentially a lot of CapEx involved, a lot of new standards to be implemented. Um, earlier on, we talked about IoT opportunities um, and Videotron is also trying to figure out their play in the IoT market. Um, as with uh, many uh, uh, operators in the United States, they're also focusing on converging Wi-Fi with mobile together. So when you are already a mobile operator and a cable operator, you can do some interesting optimizations in this case. You can, for example, re redirect the bits from the mobile network to the cable network by putting them on Wi-Fi and doing so will allow you to lower the overall operating cost. 
Okay, so then now let's move to uh, South America. Okay, so Telecom Argentina is the merger of a mobile company and the cable company. So here we really have a team of people who are talented and who understand cable and mobile market very, very well. Like Videotron being already a, um, a well-established mobile operator, Telecom Argentina also needs to go from 4G to 5G. Um, but in their case, <clears throat> they will use a 4G core to drive a 5G, the, the 5G radios. And this is also known as 5G NSA, the 5G non-standalone option. Um, Telecom Argentina owns their own cable and mobile infrastructures already. And so they're really looking at uh, how to cross leverage their mobile and cable assets in order to lower the operating cost by combining the two networks into one. So for example, one thing that's happening is they, they, they're having a one common IP backbone for the whole country instead of two. And um, they're also trying to build a world-class network which is cloud native at the core and which involves architectural and transport convergence. All the while trying to build a network that is also cost efficient and high performance. All right, so now let's look at our friends across the big pond. Europe has a rich collection of cable operators that cover the continent and they're leading the way to the future of cable and mobile convergence. Okay, so let's go to this slide first. So Vodafone has been a mobile network operator but is now also a cable operator. So we definitely have a thing or two to learn about mobile from Vodafone. Vodafone has ample bandwidth on their um, mobile network. Um, so the push to small cells is rather a longer term vision for them rather than a short term uh, necessity, necessity. They're also focused on how to operate the networks efficiently. Converging architectures, for example, can reduce the operating cost. So um, if they, if they can make all the network types look and feel the same way, if they can distill the commonalities um, out of the network layer into a common network platform, then that's going to help. And, and that would allow a common set of applications to be running and, and services to be running on top of the multiple network types. Um, so in the next slide, let's take a look at um, uh, what this really means. So I'm going to need to go back. All right, so here it is. Vodafone has described the problem of how to converge the networks they've got by uh, layering it with four different layers. The bottom layer is really the, uh, the different network types. We've got, um, we've got mobile, we've got cable, the fixed wireless access, and also the cloud infrastructures. And Above that, they build a common network platform, which includes um, authentication, policy, analytics, um, operations, and uh, automation. And, and, and that is their platform. And above that, they build their service and application layer. So now there is a common set of services and applications that allows the back end, the sales, the customer services to become common. And this is actually a huge area that is often overlooked. So the bottom line is it doesn't matter that there are multiple network types that they're operating, only that there is a network and there's that, that platform which, which abstracts the network. Okay, so, so we talked about all the operator, um, their plans, ambitions, their strategies. Let's spend a little moment to talk about the, uh, the common requirements and common technologies. One of the common themes of, is using DOCSIS as a backhaul technology for 5G. So in this chart, we see the requirements for backhaul and mid-haul and map into DOCSIS. Um, other than the front haul, you can see the DOCSIS can uh, satisfy the requirements. And the, the recommendation, our recommendation is that DOCSIS uh, works for backhaul and mid-haul, but front haul is a bit of a challenge. Uh, okay. And in terms of technologies, what are the technologies that will help drive convergence? What are some of the common themes that we have heard today from the operators? Well, for one thing, there's backhaul over DOCSIS, and then there are the two technologies that will enhance DOCSIS. 
Um, every operator expressed strong interest in uh, sync and uh, low latency. So sync is a, uh, it's a requirement for CBRS and 5G due to the TTP nature of the spectrum. And LLX, low latency XHAL, is a clever technology that reduces latency over the access network through scheduled pi pipeline, scheduler pipelining. And then there's also the configuration and management. So to help manage everything, Yang is an API style contract that helps drive the model driven telemetry and automation. And then we also talked about dual SIM, dual standby, which enables two SIMs, two networks with just one radio. And then there's also the common class framework, uh, which allows an, uh, an IP packet to transit across multiple networks with the same policy. And then the holy grail is to get to 5G. Right. And, you know, within that, that there's the com common components and the common infrastructure. Okay, so let's build a converged system together. All right, so let's start with the basic DOCSIS um, HFC plant that we all know today. There's the on-prem equipment, cable modem, Wi-Fi, set-top box. From there, the traffic will go through the cable modem, through the coax, through the analog node, analog fiber, and finally reaches the integrated CMTS in the hub. And um, there we go. Um, let's take a look at what we're doing right now today. We've gone from a single, simple uh, integrated CMTS solution to a distributed access architecture where we take the modulator to the node, where we use either remote fiber or remote Mac fiber technology. And now we have digital fiber from the hub to the node. And also IP, we, have, we also have IP to the neighborhood and uh, ethernet to the door. With DAA, uh, we can deploy what is called a coherent termination device, the CTD, which can, can, which can essentially be a, a layer two switch that will transform that 100 gig link to a bunch of uh, 10, 10 gig ports. So with those 10 gig ports, you can put different servers on them, right? An obvious choice is the, the DAA uh, architecture, but then also, also we can also put the 5G uh, radio unit uh, so that we can use uh, that fiber for uh, direct fiber for front hall. And we can also provide uh, enterprise uh, services and pawn services as well. We talk about the, uh, the fake, fixed wireless access, which is a great opportunity for the MSOs to extend their footprint. And then there's also the DOCSIS piece. Um, we can introduce the 5G mid on the uh, backhaul for DOCSIS that connects over the DOCSIS network. The advantage is that the uh, network is already there and you can interconnect tens or even uh, hundreds of small cells over, um, over that existing plant without having to layer new fiber. Um, so this is transport convergence really. Um, on the other side of the, that transport convergence story is the convergence that is happening at the, at the head end. Um, adjacent to your CMTS core and video core, for example, you can put the mobile core there. Those are the blue boxes that's shown and either adjacent to the head end or in true cloud, like large scale Amazon AWS, you can have your 5G core and even some of the cable components that, uh, that controls everything. Okay, so that's our baseline, right? So, so that we can put software components in the head end or the cloud, it means that we have edge compute, which can be located, for example, in the head end. And we also need to locate timing in order to pass network timing over DOCSIS. That's what that red box of uh, the PTP Grandmaster is all about. Okay, so finally, once we build this network, we have to configure it and we, know, we have to know that if it is working well. So this is something that Cable Apps is focusing on, that we're building a Yang interface to all the DOCSIS components. So through that Yang interface, um, we can achieve two things. We can uh, configure things and we can have model-driven telemetry. So in this environment, we can collect data, we can analyze them, we can do things in an automatic way. And really automation is the future and potentially the most important aspect. Um, you know, how do we get this automation and telemetry right? Okay, so we've come to the end of our presentation here. Um, there are really a few things to reiterate. The first point is today's cable operators are, tomorrow, are tomorrow's mobile operators. There's not just no such thing as just cable company anymore. 
almost every cable operator is, is either uh, renting airtime or becoming a mobile operator. Um, so we have converged customers, we have converged businesses, and now we need a converged network. This is the challenge really um, that we're facing today. And this is exactly what this paper is addressing today. And the goal is to lead to a common set of technologies that will successfully enable cable mobile deployments. The second point is every great wireless network needs a great wireline, wireline network. The wireless networks are only composed of air and is located at the very edge of the network. Everything else is a wireline network. So if you want to build a wireless network, you have to figure out where all the wires are. Our premise here is really that the HFC plant itself is a great wireline network. It connects everything together. It connects people together. It connects things together, the homes together. And in the near future, small cells together, which would support 5G uh, radio access network. So if you want to build a uh, wireless network, you need a great wireline network behind it. And you may even end up spending more money on that wireline network than on the radios themselves. The third point, the final point is um, convergence is not a simple form or a simple solution. It can take many forms, each with different types of technologies with different timelines and different returns on the investment. The first step everybody probably do is to combine their IP networks together, so network convergence. And what everyone is trying to figure out right now is the cloud, when to move to cloud, where to move, how to move. And then externally to the customers, what does it mean when you connect to uh, a charter network, a video chat network, a Vodafone network, you become a customer with, a, with shared cable and mobile services. What does it really mean to you as a customer? What do you get for it? And that is the ultimate thing that we'll have to figure out. I want to thank all my collaborators and uh, thank you, Craig, and I'll pass the baton back to you. Okay, thanks, Jennifer, that was excellent. It was a great overview of what different operators around the world are doing in terms of thinking about uh, fixed mobile convergence. And I really like the conclusion slide where, where you talk about uh, different definitions of convergence, IP convergence, cloud convergence, policy management convergence, access convergence, they all have different timelines and different returns, but <coughs> all different to think about. All right, at this point, I'm going to transition. Uh, well, before we do that, I will uh, make one more request to the audience to send your questions in. There was uh, rich content there to, to ask a lot of questions about, and I uh, do uh, fully encourage the audience to send those questions in uh, so, so that we've uh, got a, a robust discussion uh, at the end of our time. At this point, we're gonna transition to our next speaker, uh, many of you, uh, uh, know very well, John Chapman. He's uh, been part of the cable industry for a long time. I've worked with John for a long time and has always found him to be uh, very provocative uh, and forward moving in terms of uh, technology innovation. Uh, John is a Cisco fellow and the CTO of the cable access business. Uh, he co-founded uh, the cable business unit within Cisco in 1996 uh, as an internal startup and he's driven innovation in DOCSIS since that time, including inventing Here's acronym suit, but uh, I'm sure everybody will know this. Uh, DSG, DTP, LLX, DOCSIS bonding, and Remote 5. Those are impressive credentials. Uh, John is a member of the SCT Hall of Fame, uh, a member of the Cable TV Pioneer Society, has over 40 publications, and holds over 130 filed or issued patents. That is prolific. John is going to talk to us today about, uh, uh, more specifically, uh, small cell traffic engineering models. So we talk about... Uh, overall network convergence as we think about how we would potentially deploy small cells uh, on plant, HFC or fiber, uh, we have to think about the traffic model uh, for how that uh, deployment will be effective. And so John's going to dig into the details of that. I'm excited to, to listen to his presentation. John, take it away. Thank you, Craig. So let's talk about some small cell traffic engineering. I like to build on some uh, themes that Jennifer laid down in her presentation. That really is today's cable operators are tomorrow's mobile operators. And it, it's more just moving into a service. Just think back 20 years ago, maybe 30 years ago, when the cable operators of the day were video providers. 
and they moved into broadband. They started delivering doxes. Did that change their business? I would say it revolutionized their business and made them into a new company. They're now embracing mobile. You can't just deploy mobile without becoming a mobile company. And as doing that, there's a lot of challenges that have to really be understood and overcome. So let's start understanding, first of all, what is a small cell? When you hear LTE, LTE is typically, typically at 700 megahertz. There's antennas on top of very tall towers that can go very long distances. There was a small cell back then, a Pico cell that helped fill in the LTE area, the dead spots, but that's not really what we're talking about. We're talking about small cells that enable operators to get into new spectrum. So CBRS, for example, is at 3.5 gigahertz and uh, Verizon's going into 28 gigahertz. Both of these are gonna be deployed with small cells. And I think the significant thing here is there is no big antenna that covers 10 miles of radius for CBRS. It's a new physical RF plant that needs to be built. And therein lies the challenge. So whereas the macro cells for LTE stood on big towers, the small cells <clears throat> go on something like uh, what they call urban furniture, a lamppost, a rooftop, a wall. And instead of having maybe a 10 to 30 kilometer coverage, they might have 50 to 500 meters. If you look at the ratio of that, that's, that's percentage points. So my goodness, if you have to deploy these radios, how many small cells does it take to really cover that one area of a macro cell? We're going to break that down today. Uh, I started kind of working with frequency uh, formulas and things like this. It, it turns out uh, it, it's a really hard thing to do because when you put down these radios, you run into trees, walls, and hills, which just mess up all the math. So I, I drew some uh, information from a report by Moffat Nathanson, which basically said, all right, if we have a radius for an LTE 700 megahertz radio, and then we just go to CBRS or millimeter wave, what happens to that radius? So I started with that and I, I end up working up a formula in the paper. Oh, it's, we're not advancing. There we go. I worked a formula in the paper where um, how many of those small cells, have, like how many small circles fit in the big circle, really? But it, it's not just small circles because uh, if you have circles adjacent to each other, then you end up with gaps. So what I did is I took a square inside of each circle and if you adjacent the squares, you get perfect overlap. So these formulas really are what happens if you have perfect layout of small cells uh, how many does it take to go to the large area? So for my max, I put um, overlap or adjacent squares into a large circle. And for my minimum, I put small squares into a large square. So if you really in enjoyed your high school algebra, you'll really enjoy the paper. Uh, I've got the formulas down here and, and here's really the results. So if you look at the top line, 700 megahertz LTE is deployed at the macro cell, has a relative radius of one, and you need one radio. And then you go to CBRS at 3.5 gigahertz. Uh, it's deployed as small cells. It had a relative radius of only 9%, so 0 0.09. And when you work through the math, you can have as many as 200 radios, 125 to 200 radios. So how do you deploy that? And then for 28 gigahertz, which is something where Verizon's going, they have to. It, it takes about 175,000 radios to replace one radio. So. All I can say is those poor buggers are going to have a hard time wiring up 175,000 radios, or even 10% of those would be still 2,000 radios. But here's, here's the business case I want everybody to walk away with. If you're putting a, a radio on the top of a tower, and by the way, you don't even have to buy the tower. You rent, everybody rents towers. You just you rent towers, you rent power. I, uh, the telcos rent backhaul from the cable companies. They rent a fire. You just rent everything and put a radio up. That's not too bad, right? Cost twenty to fifty thousand dollars to do that. If you're going to deploy two hundred radios instead of one, do you really want to take fifty thousand and multiply by two hundred? I mean, if all you ever want to do is spend as much money as it took to build the LTE network, which is billions and billions of dollars, you just want to spend that much money again, and you want to deploy two hundred radios, you got to do it at less than one percent of the cost. Like you need to deploy a radio at a cost point of one hundred dollars to two hundred and fifty dollars not 20,000 to 50,000. That's the challenge. How do you do that? I mean, literally that's free. Oh, by the way, those poor uh, millimeter wave guys are gonna have to figure out how to do this for 60, six cents to 14 cents. 
good luck to them. But luckily the, the cable guys who are deploying CBRS, they already have a wireline plant. And that's really what we're gonna talk about today. You know, the $100 to $250 seems like an incredible discount to what it costs to deploy LTE. But you know what? That's what it costs to deploy a cable modem. We got a cable modem in everybody's houses. It costs that much to deploy it. What if a small cell was as cheap as, and as easy to deploy as, a cable modem and hooked to an existing plant? Wouldn't that be wonderful? Shaw did an analysis last year at SCT where they uh, put some small cells in downtown Calgary and looked at either running fiber for five blocks to a fiber node or just hooking right into the coax. Uh, they found out that the deployment costs were indeed 1% of the cost. And, and equally as important, instead of taking six months to deploy those small cells, they could do it in a week. So 1% of the cost and 20 times faster. There's more information on this in the white paper, but the results are there. And this is what it looks like. Here is an example of a directional coupler that goes in the HFC plant. It gives you not only broadband access, but power, which is really important. Now I went down to a strand mount cable modem and into a strand mount small cell. And if you're gonna deploy something, you really need location, real estate, power, and backhaul, all of which are solved either by going strand mount on the HFC plant or locating the small cell inside of a subscriber's home. So the next part of this discussion really is, if I have an HFC plant, how many small cells are gonna land on that thing? And a lot of people say, well, why not just put the small cell inside the fiber node? Well, of course, there's gonna be massive interference if you did that between the HFC plant and the small cell. And there's not enough power to do that. So it's gotta be outside the small cell, outside the fiber node. But really it isn't one small cell for fiber node. I mean, you can have a fiber node at N plus zero or fiber node at N plus five or six amplifiers deep. It covers different geographical areas. So it would make sense that you have a different number of small cells. So I ran the same math thing. I said, all right, I've got a radius for a small cell. I'm going to make it look like a square. And you know that, that HFC plant, it goes down one block and, down, and across another block. It's in a zigzag thing. I could build an equivalent radius of a uh, HFC plant. And so I did that in the formulas, mashed them together, and I end up with this table. So uh, this table's in feet, um, although you could easily put it inside of meters. <clears throat> what we have on the left-hand side of the table is the number of amplifier depth of the plant, the total number of linear feet of the plant. So an N plus zero plant might be 1100 linear feet. Uh, and then each uh, segment gets, you know, the average span goes down as we, as we build the plant out. I calculated the radius for each of these spans. And then <clears throat> depending upon the radius of the small cell, you get a different number of radios. And I, I did this example where the small cell radius was a round number so that you guys, if you were at 750, you could just kind of interpolate the table. Um, but if we just take, you know, the 400, the 500 foot radius of a small cell, which if you've got trees and hills is, is what it is. For an N plus zero plant, you might need one to four radios, you know? So, you know, maybe you get lucky and it's a flat area or maybe you have to do each quadrant. But look at an N plus five plant, you need anywhere from 25 to hundred radios on that HFC plant. <clears throat> That's a lot of radius. Is there enough bandwidth to support that? Well, we had a lot of talks this week at SCT of DOCSIS 3.1 and 4.0 and the amount of bandwidth is there. Uh, there is really plenty of bandwidth inside the plant. Uh, there's 100x growth uh, in the plant. And I, I won't dwell on this right now because other speakers um, have dwelled on that. But let me take a look at this specific CBRS use case. Can I really drop 100 CBRS radios on the plant? Well, CBRS itself works in chunks of 50, uh, uh, 50 megabits per second. So 10 megahertz spectrum chunks, 50 megabits per second per chunk. And you can aggregate those chunks together. So if you have two of those chunks of spectrum, it's 100 megabit. Maybe 200 megabit if you're doing four, but let's say 100 megabit. Can you drop 200 of those on, this, on, the, on an HFC plant? Of course you can. The uh, lowest speed modem we stick on a cable plant is 100 megabits per second. We typically put 500 or a gigabit per second modem on there. So there's actually plenty of bandwidth that goes on there. And if you put it in everybody's home, it just supplements the cable modem that's there. It actually might not even add that much more bandwidth to get onto the plant. So that fits. Um, a couple of things that could enhance the HFC plant that we uh, are gonna talk about today. Um, 
taking timing over the cable network is something uh, Cisco recently invented and Elias following this talk is gonna go in and talk about how that works. Uh, Jennifer also hinted at LLX, which again is something that uh, Cable Labs and Cisco originally invented. It pipelines a scheduler in the uh, small cell to the scheduler of the DOCSIS system so that the small cell tells the DOCSIS system what's going to happen next, and the DOCSIS system can pre-issue grants. It allows DOCSIS to have the equivalent of one to two milliseconds of latency, and it, it works for all the traffic that the small cell is aware of, which is, of course, 100% of the traffic coming through it. So it's a, it's a very, very nice method for achieving low latency uh, for backhaul. So in conclusion, today's cable operators are tomorrow's mobile operators. That's a lot of new mobile operators, so that's good news for anybody who's making mobile equipment. And for everybody who's a cable company, your life is about to change. Um, we're seeing a lot of convergence right now, a lot of uh, operators and cable, cable operators, mobile operators either getting together in the same company or working together. It's gonna take a lot of small cells to deploy. Whether you're a mobile company or a cable company, you have to deploy hundreds of these small cells in new spectrum to be able to generate a service, which means that your economies have to be, your deployment economies have to be 1% of they were before. So whoever you are, you have to think completely different about the deployment of mobile. It is a new world. And luckily this is a world that I think that the cable companies have a huge advantage of because behind every great wireless network, is a great wireline network. And the HSC plant with DOCSIS is a great wireline network. Thanks very much. Thank you, John. That was that was excellent. And you know, it's a really important point that you're making as we, you know, transition from 2G, 3G, 4G network to 5G networks. It's even started in 4G, but certainly with 5G, it, it really will require more of a transformation from a macro cell network to a small cell network. If you think about what that means, we really have to power that small cell infrastructure with a deeply distributed wireline uh, network. That's exactly what HFC is. So I, I really agree with that uh, overall conclusion that, that there's an exciting opportunity to converge the access network and, and to drive a small cell uh, outcome using, using HFC. All right, uh, keep the questions coming uh, for the audience. We've got some really good questions so far, but uh, keep them coming. I think this is, uh, again, rich content, uh, uh, open for a lot of discussion and questions, so I encourage that. Uh, in the meantime, we're going to transition to our next speaker, uh, Elias Tavaria Reyes. Uh, mm -hmm. Elias works with, um, with John as well at Cisco. He's a PhD from Georgia Tech. That's impressive by itself. Uh, he holds two U.S. patents. He drives innovation in next generation technologies at Cisco, working directly for the CTO of the Cable Business Unit, which happens to be John. Uh, Elias is based in Silicon Valley and loves to connect with people. He's really gonna focus on a specific component today, timing and synchronization, in, in particular DOCSIS timing protocol. So as we think about how we overlay small cell infrastructure onto an HFC plan, it's not just the physical connectivity, of course, it is how do we uh, make sure that we have appropriate timing uh, and protocol uh, coexistence um, uh, with the requirements for a small cell infrastructure uh, over, uh, over DOCSIS. And so Elias is gonna talk to us about that in more detail. Elias, take it away. Thank you, Craig. Uh, first, also wanna give thanks to John, my co-author in this paper for all his contributions. So today I'll be talking about two main areas. One is the why behind the DOCSIS time protocol, why we need it. And then I'll dive into the how, how the DOCSIS time protocol works and how it can be used in a live system to drive all these small cells that John and Jennifer described previously. So let's get started. First, why do we need it? What's the problem we're trying to solve? Imagine for a second one of these mobile networks that Jennifer described. We have the base stations, we have the mobile phones and they are transmitting them. By some reason, they are misaligned. One is going upstream, one is going downstream. So they will cause interference to each other. In one direction, we will cause interference at the base stations that they are called inode Bs. And in the other direction, there will be interference at the mobile device. Those are called UEs uh, in 3GPP terminology. Then what's the solution to this problem? 3GPP, the standardization organization for mobile networks, identify that by keeping the base stations within three microseconds of time alignment, they could avoid the issues. So that's great. Now, how do we bring this to a reality? 
Well, we can put a common time reference and make everybody to be within 1.5 microseconds on, of that time reference. So the network in between has a budget of 1.5 microseconds. So that's the solution. Uh, but what does all these mobile story have to do with Doxys? And I think Jennifer and John already covered it very well. So as they both described, all cable operators are or will become mobile operators. So that means they will be using their Doxys backhaul to provide or the Doxys network as a backhaul for the mobile network. And that backhaul needs to provide timing information. And DTP empowers this. At a very high level, what we are doing is the following. At the CMTS, we are coupling the doc system and frequency to an external reference. Then within DOCSIS, we'll use DTP to compensate for path delay and asymmetry. And then at the cable modem at the end, we'll take the doc system and frequency and propagate it down to the small cells. At a high level, that's what we are doing. Now let's dive a little bit deeper. First, the basics of timing, 1588. At a high level, 1588 works as follows. We'll send a timestamp from the master to this clock slave, and then we'll exchange these messages called delay request and delay response to figure out what's the path delay and the asymmetry so that the slave can compensate for that. Within Doxys, we'll use something similar. We'll use the Doxys timestamp and the DTP messages to replace the PTP messages. And more details on the specifics you'll find on the paper. But now let's look at DTP. How do we determine this path delay? Let's think of a live network. At the highest level, we can think of it as having the CMTS, having the cable modem on the other side, and an HFC network in between. And we can split that into upstream and downstream. And our goal is to determine the overall forward path delay. If we look at these blocks, it becomes very clear that it is the total delay of the equipment, CMTS and cable modem, plus the HFC. So let's focus now on the HFC. How do we find that part? Well, if we have a reference system that is just CMTS and cable modem, and we compare the reference to the field system, we'll notice that the difference divided by two is the HFC. So that's the basics, the rationale for from how DTP will work. But this requires then knowing the values for the CMTS and the cable model. So there needs some calibration to happen. And Cable Labs is driving some initiatives in this direction. Now let's dive even deeper into the model. The DTP model looks at each element as having different time uh, contributing components. And some of these will be fixed. Some of these will be configuration dependent. Uh, and I won't dive into the details. For those, again, look at the paper. I'll just highlight some of the main takeaways. What we want to know is the elements that are now highlighted in red. This is the forward path delay. If we were to know all those, then we can put at the end of the cable modem the adjustment to compensate for that forward path delay. So that's one main aspect. The second is that with DDP, we introduced the concept of true range offset that will capture this, the total upstream and downstream path delay. And so here you can see it on the left, it's highlighted as true ranging offset. So DTP will operate by using the true ranging offset reported by the cable modem. We'll use some knowledge of these DTP parameters to figure out that last value of the cable modem to do the cable modem time adjustment. The challenge is that some of these, these timing Elements cannot be measured independently. There's no equipment today that can do that. So we need a way to measure some of these jointly between the CMTS and the cable modem and then for the HFC. So let's go into some of the math to do this calibration. Uh, I won't go through the whole math, but use the main takeaways here. First, we'll look at the reference length plan to characterize a combination of CMTS and cable modem. And the formulas here, what we'll, the main takeaway is that we will get the true ranging offset as reported by the cable modem, the adjustment to bring the time error to zero, that's all either manually calibrated or reported by the cable modem, 
And all that characterizes a combination of the CMTS and the cable modem parameters, which is the goal of step one, jointly characterize these two. Step number two is let's characterize the HFC elements. Now for that, again, these are the final formulas, but the main takeaway is that everything on the right side is either a value that was reported by the cable modem, manually calibrated, calculated, or obtained from step number one at the reference length plan. So we'll get a numeric value for the HFC parameters. Now, final step, we did some pre-calibrations with a reference length plan for the HFC. How do we use that in a live toxic system? Again, final formula here, but main takeaways is that we can reuse the, out, the values we obtain from the reference length plan, the HFC, and with the true rain offset reported in a live system, we can compute that cable modem adjustment time that the cable modem would use. So that goes all the way from calibration to using it in a live system. So great, we have DTP is working. Everything is great. Couple of uh, caveats and things to remember. First, DTP requires new D31 cable modems. Uh, as far as I know, there's no cable modems on the field that support DTP or 1588 uh, in the output. Also, we require the use of OFDM as primary downstream channel. That is because the accuracy of DTP relies in part on using the OFDM extended timestamp. So we need OFDM. Another, at the beginning, I mentioned 1.5 microseconds of budget from the time reference to the end applications. Now, DOCSIS is just a part of this whole budget. So we don't get the whole thing. So remember that part. Now going to the right side of the slide. In PTP, there is traceability information. DTP doesn't take care of that. Nonetheless, in our work with John, Jennifer, and many other collaborators, on the sync spec, we created a way to pass this traceability information. Now, as Jennifer pointed out, automation, 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 that's key to make all this scalable. We need automation for a live system to recover the right values for a particular cable modem and identify what, what are the HFC elements in between. So automation. Um, at a high level, what is it that we're trying to do with the DP and DOCSIS? Again, from the external time reference compiled back to DOCSIS, DTP takes into account the path delay and the symmetry. And on the other side, the cable modem propagates a new regenerated time and frequency information. And the accuracy will depend on how well the models, the elements were calibrated. And of course, there's the clocking hardware of each of the elements. Uh, next step, so we have DTP, uh, that's great. We have the sync spec released IO1 there. IO2 will be out soon. So what's next is I will, I will describe it as calibration and automation. We need to have joint calibration of these CMTS and cable modems, store that information somewhere that could be either cable apps or operators or vendors can decide to have their own way of storing the data and automation systems to recover that data that's to operationalize DTP. And the next ideal step will be to have the industry to build calibration tools that could look at the devices individually, because today, again, we are looking at joint calibrations. Uh, so summary, a recap. The DOCSIS system is already based on a highly precise time. And what DTP is doing is leveraging this asset. So operators have two options right now. We can, they can try to run NTP or PTP over the top and let those protocols try to deal with DOCSIS asymmetries, or they can reuse their existing asset of the DOCSIS system and use ETP and have a high quality, high precision timing output for their small cells. Now, one last caveat, it may be argued that, well, we can put a GPS at the small cell. Yes, you can, it's more expensive and GPS doesn't just work everywhere. DTP will work everywhere that you are plugging a cable modem that supports it. And with that, I think this is my last slide. Thank you very much. Elias, thank you. That was excellent. Really important and critical uh, element of, of how fixed mobile convergence will actually be enabled. Uh, we have to have 
um, precise timing as we overlay small cell infrastructure into the DOCSIS plant. And uh, I think that was an excellent introduction in, in terms of the challenges and, and the solutions to address that. All right, we're going to transition to our last uh, but not least speaker, uh, Bill Beasley from, from Fujitsu. Uh, Bill's tenure with Cox Communications and then more recently with Fujitsu have given him deep insider knowledge of real-world challenges that MSOs face as they tackle unprecedented, unprecedented operational and technical transformation. And certainly fixed mobile convergence is one of those transformations. Uh, he combines hands-on experience with strategic whole industry vision of the art, architecture, and science of communications networking. Uh, I think Bill is going to uh, sort of wrap this up, talk about some of the protocols and solutions that have been referenced uh, throughout uh, the earlier presentations, and then ask some, some questions uh, in terms of, hey, HSC is this excellent wireline infrastructure, but what are the limitations in terms of how it can support uh, fixed mobile convergence? When is HSC uh, versus fiber uh, the, the better outcome? And so I think it's a very interesting look at, at trying to wrap this all together and, and uh, ask some important questions in terms of how we get to this uh, end state outcome. So Bill, with that, please take it away. Thanks, Craig, and uh, I want to say thanks to the SCTE for allowing me to be a part of an historic Cable Tech Expo, the first virtual. I'm sure many of us will look back on this years to come and uh, we'll talk about with people. You remember that time when. Um, I bring this slide up right here. This is the, um, the results of the last Spectrum auction um, that the SCC held recently, and this is the top 20 purchases of, purchases of Spectrum. And the reason why I bring this up is I talk not only to um, MSOs in North America and the US and Canada, um, but I also talk to wireless providers. And then I also, obviously in the industry, I talk to, to providers of wireless equipment. And one thing that I, that I find interesting and, and sort of confounding in, in a way is outside of the MSO space, there's a lot of talk about, we don't really think cable companies are serious about wireless. And so I bring the slide up to show of the 20 purchasers, top 20 purchasers of the SEC at auctions, six of them are US wireless or US cable companies. They spent $1.2 billion just among themselves buying up Spectrum in this last auction. Um, and then obviously um, you have companies like um, Charter and Comcast and Altice who are doing MVNOs. And my response back to them is, how can you not see that the cable industry is serious about getting into wireless? Um, it's critical. Customers are just are, are moving. Uh, they want to be mobile. They want to get their their information everywhere. And the cable companies are going to be a part of that. Um, and they're going to do it in lots of ways. So the thing I bring here is this this sort of this idea of a convergence of seemingly contrary um, technologies. And it's this idea that we have these these things that are coming together um, in different industry standards and different layers of the network that that present a really great and new opportunity to for providing services um, with our HSC and our fiber networks. And the first one is um, the low latency X hall, which is often talked about as low latency DOCSIS. If you ever talk to anybody that's not in the MS in industry, they conflate those. Um, but I, I, I tend to, you know, I do know the difference between X hall and low latency DOCSIS, but I mentioned here that outside the industry, people will say low latency DOCSIS and conflate the two together. I'm okay with that, we'll, we'll just move on. Um, also TIP itself has a VRAN front hall project group, which is working on a really interesting project that Cable Labs is a part of. And it's this idea of non-ideal front hall. And then we'll talk about a little bit about SDN and, and sort of software control of networks. I think the first thing we need to talk about though, when we talk about small cells and we talk about the, the mood of 5G is this, this protocol called CIPRI. It's, it's been in our networks for a while. Um, we've typically carried it with uh, dark fiber, um, but at its essence, it separates the remote radio unit, unit from the baseband unit. It takes that RF processing and then all that control processing and it moves them apart. Now, originally it was designed to do it um, to get the, the BBU off the tower and down into a hut at the bottom of the tower. And that is why in the protocol itself, it kind of expects this really low latency, the 75 microseconds of latency. That's not milliseconds, folks. It's microseconds, not a typo. But the idea is that I can further centralize that BBU and allow for distributed antennas. And this is what 5G needs, right? It needs lots of antennas. We just saw in the previous presentation, it needs lots of antennas dispersed out into lots of areas of the network. So SIPR will become an important part. However, 
this front haul transport, as we, we call it, is today really, really difficult to do over, over cable modems. Technically, it's not possible um, outside of the lab, but hold that thought because I don't think that's always going to be the case because we have another standard that's working sort of in parallel with the things that Cable Labs is doing is this idea of non-ideal front haul. Now, it was designed to take the front haul network, not the mid haul and back haul, which we've been doing for a while now, all these technologies, but move it down into technologies that were readily available in the access network and allow for this, this front haul network to exist in things like G.Fast or HFC or PON or multi-hot microwave or even campus ethernet networks. And that's what you need if you wanna do a lot of radios and that's why TIP's interested in it. Now actually Cable Labs did the lab for the low latency DOCSIS X haul um, with front haul. Doesn't yet support front haul, um, but they have demonstrated it, it does work at least in the lab that you can get um, um, latency of up to 30 milliseconds to the UE, the user equipment, and it still connects. So that's really good news. That's really a good sign. And I think over the next few years, we'll see front haul along with LLX really become um, collaborative technologies that will allow us to continue to use the HFC network to a greater degree than we can today with just doing mid haul and back haul. But there's a lot to consider when you're going to move to HFC. There's more than just the bandwidth. Obviously, we can do 50, millibit, uh, 50 megabits per second. Um, but that's, that's one service to one customer in a, in a piece of plant that might be serving hundreds of customers. Um, we, have, we have lots of demands on the HFC networks in terms of generating a revenue for the company. And we need to consider the, the, the additive um, uh, bandwidth that the, these radios bring into play. And, and by the way, unlike your business services customers and your residential customers where you can really oversubscribe that bandwidth, when those radios turn on, when the first handset turns on today, they're, they're transmitting it at full line rate, right? They don't ramp up as more and more handsets come on. That's the way they work today. So oversubscribing that bandwidth becomes much more difficult. I'm not saying it's bad. So you have to kind of think about this, this thing um, of, of consuming max bandwidth and really play into your, your, your bandwidth calculations and your, your revenue calculations for taking that customer on and make sure you, you um, account for that. Also in, in DOCSIS today, as you, as you decrease latency, you, you, you subscribe more and more upstream bandwidth through allocated pre-allocated time slots. Um, and upstream bandwidth is, you know, not arguably is the most valuable piece of the um, um, spectrum that we have today. So think about the average revenue per unit versus res residential and commercial. It's just one of those um, things you should put in your thought process. Lastly, I want to talk about reliability. Um, my experience in, in past life delivering services to wireless providers is they don't like to have low reliability. They expect that thing to be there all the time because they're accountable to their customers. And, you know, HSC reliability is not fiber reliability. Um, um, and today, the only operator I'm aware of that's using a ring of ring architecture in their HSC network is Cox. So that reliability goes down in order of magnitude better. It's still a great network, right? It does, it does work highly reliably and it, it, it does work really, really well, but it's not fiber reliability. It's not apples to apples. And then secondly, think about your operations response time. A lot of us staff for um, operations people to be there and take care of that fiber network in real time because we have business services on it today. HSC reliability, even in business services, has traditionally been best effort. And that's something you might not be able to do with your if you're carrying wireless traffic. Um, so the other thing is, is we, we talked about these operational challenges. These carriers require, they demand higher service levels. You need to bring that into your, into your thought processes as you deploy this. Am I prepared to support that? Also, how, how, think about how the service can be deployed consistently and repeatedly, right? You're gonna have to coordinate with the wireless operator. They maintain the radio, you maintain the transport, that now, that now radio and transport might be sitting on your strand. Um, it's pretty important to do little things like remember your engineers and their radio guys probably need to have bucket trucks. I've actually been in that instance where we were putting wireless out uh, on the network and we forgot that our engineers didn't have bucket trucks and we had to call, call a maintenance guy to come over and help. So you have to think about that coordination. Also think about how you're gonna monitor that service health, monitor and manage it. Are you prepared today to be managing these services and, and managing them in a way that's unified with existing fiber services because the, in all likelihood, you're gonna be having a hybrid network where you're doing fiber services for some radios and coax services for others. 
the expectation of that customer is you're monitoring both of those as a service, not a network. You have to think about that when you do it. Also, who's going to install, repair, and maintain, right? Who's going to who's going to go when the thing's broken? Get in the bucket truck, get up there, and fix it. Who are your fix agents, and what new tools do they need? Do they need new software tools? Do they need to know new things about new technologies? Are your engineers going to have to be, become RF guys, or your RF guys become engineers? And how are you going to train them? So just remember that you know, unlike uh, the the rest of the world who thinks that doing something the first time is the hardest. In our world, doing something the first time is the easy one. Doing it the next 1,000 times is where it's really hard. And you have to think about that. So I want to point in here this idea of a software-driven network. So I, I mentioned in the previous slide that, that HSC and fiber hybrid will be probably how you're delivering the services of the customer. You need to have software. And, and by the way, the software that's out today, the, the micro apps, uh, moving away from monolithic uh, network management systems to micro apps so we can glue together topologies and, and have service views rather than technology views are really good. That exists, but you need to think about how you're going to have a unified topology view of both your HSC and fiber-based services network for this X hall. Um, and potentially even how you're going to extend those views to the customer who may be de demanding a, wall, a, a view into that so they can see that their service is operating. The important part is much like in other areas of our, 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 our operations, the operations teams today are, are traditionally managing a product or a technology. They're monitoring the fiber network. They're monitoring the CMTSs. They need to shift to monitoring the service, the solution you're providing the customer. So your tools and your views and your technologies need to lend itself towards providing them a view of the service health, not the network health. And that's a shift in the technologies. And actually it's a shift that's happening in much of our operations. But lastly, um, you know, as, as Jennifer mentioned, Cable Labs is working on a unified Yang model. And the reason we want to do this is you don't want to be swivel chairing and gluing services together manually, um, especially when you get into 5G, where 5G services um, for things like private 5G requires technologies like network slicing. And that doesn't happen at the edge. It has to happen all the way through the network. So you need a level of automation that can allow you to service create in both the HFC domain and the fiber domain. And ideally this needs to be automated, otherwise it doesn't scale. So software automation is gonna be our best friend as service complexity um, um, continues to drive our network and as we, we try and bring on new services and new, gener new revenue generating opportunities. Okay, so what I'm saying here is HFC is really the only tool. I, I, I mentioned in a, in a previous uh, conversation is, I don't really see myself as, a, as an engineer. I don't see myself with a hammer walking around trying to call things nails, right? It's a tool. It's a great tool. It's a tool that's, that covers most of our network. And it, it's really a, a way to enable uh, the deep distribution of lots and lots and lots of radios really quickly. And 5G is going to drive millions of new antenna deployments. And the HSC network's ready to go. We're, we're ready to be stood up where other people are going to have to build out. Um, Fiber deep initiatives are also out there. We're doing, you know, the DAA and other fiber deep initiatives will actually allow support for further fiber activities and further fiber, on board, fiber onboarding. And that might be the right way to do it. But we still need HSC where fiber is really not practicable. Um, it's expensive to build in rural areas. You know, fiber costs about $150,000 a mile on average to build in the US. If you got to build 30 kilometers of it, that's expensive. If you already got coax there, use it. Um, there's also high cost build areas. Uh, I have had experience in working in Las Vegas, and I can tell you that if you want to trench on the Las Vegas Strip, you're out of luck. You're not going to build anything down there. Um, those, it's just too high cost and it doesn't work. Or a lot of times it takes too long to, to, to construct. We, we saw that Shaw said that is 20 times faster if I already had the coax there. That's actually a really good reason to use coax. But it's not going to be the same as our current residential and HSC commercial products. We need new training. We need new tools. We need new support processes to take advantage of this really, really valuable asset. So as you're thinking about deploying your services over HFC, either for yourself or for their other operators, here's the kind of the things that I encourage you to think about in both your operations and your finance level is talk about the, the value of your asset. Can I use that bandwidth to make more revenue somewhere else? Um, is my serving group size really prepared um, to take on the additional bandwidth, especially given that that bandwidth, once it's on, it's lit up. And then think about other customers that, in, that, in that area. Um, you want to think about things like, 
if you have to do uh, maintenance in the middle of the night, are you are you able to do that in a in a realistic way? Today we tend we tend to take that um, for granted, much like we used to take for granted before we did phone service, that we could do maintenance anytime we wanted to. And then lastly, um, you need to have really serious and open and honest, transparent conversations with your customer and make sure their expectations are appropriate around reliability and resiliency. Um, the HSA network's a really highly reliable and resilient network. I'm not trying to knock it, but we can all admit that we can get, maintain a much higher order of service and SLA over fiber than we, we can over to the HS, HSC. And then lastly, talk about how you're gonna respond to um, events because it will break and uh, it will break at the worst possible moment and when you're least prepared for it. So talk about how you're gonna get out there and, and do it in an, effective, in an effective way that meets your customer's expectations. And with that, I uh, wanna say thank you and I'll turn it back to Craig. And uh, thanks again, SCTE. All right, thanks, Bill. That was really uh, intriguing in terms of thinking through some of the practical uh, implementation uh, dynamics in terms of uh, how we would implement uh, fixed mobile convergence. We have uh, really uh, just five minutes for Q&A. Uh, I know there's a, uh, a mechanism to follow up with the individual speakers for, so we won't get to all the questions, but I do want to get to a couple of them uh, while we still have some time. So the first one I'm going to direct towards Jennifer. Uh, one of the questions, can the head end be implemented in the cloud as a whole or just in general, you know, how does cloud native software containerized architecture enable fixed mobile convergence? Okay. Thanks, Craig, and thanks for the uh, thank thank for the, um, the 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 person who posed the question. It, it's it's you know when you think about cloud, what is special about cloud? Well, scalability. That's definitely one thing. It lowers the cost of uh, lowers the cost, and is easy to deploy. Um, so then, why do we need the head end? Well, you know, it turns out that the one of the things about the head end is its latency the ability to use the head end to provide edge compute. Um, if we think about cloud, it's thousands of kilometers from the end user itself, right? So generally you want to put non-real-time uh, you know, functions in the cloud and real-time uh, functions in, you know, near closer to the user, right? In fact, the 3GPP has standardized, standardized what is called the COPS architecture, controlling user plane separation. So, you know, in the mobile case that they are, they can put the user plane function closer to the edge and control pr control plane function in the cloud. So, so I think that the bottom line is that for cable operators, you know, there's a lot of thought on, okay, this head end provides a really good piece of real estate. And the question here is that what are the, some of the use cases that allows us to monetize its potentials? Thanks, uh, Jennifer. Let me get to one more question. It's probably uh, the only, the last question we'll have time for today, although there really were some good questions here and there's some, uh, you know, some follow-up that we can do. This one I'm going to direct towards John. Uh, John, uh, one of the questions, some of these small cells use up to 300 watts. There's a huge load on the existing HSC power with the number of millimeter wave radios that John shows will be required, or CBS radios for that matter. That's a lot of power investment. Will building up the power infrastructure add large delays to deployment speed? Yeah, so really, how do we accommodate all that power? Uh, first of all, there are different power levels of CBRS smart cells. There's a class A and a class B, and maybe even a new class C at different power levels, I was assuming the lower power ones. But if we put everything, if we put 200 small cells on an HSC plant, yeah, we probably are going to exceed the power budget of the HSC plant. But the economics of putting small cells on HSC plant may make it worth upgrading the power infrastructure in the HSC plant. Uh, it, it's a powering mechanism. Um, why not take advantage of it? Of course, the best place really to locate the small cells is in the home where the, the real estate is there, the power is there, and the broadband connectivity is there. And if you're really going to be deploying 200 small cells on a, on a fiber node, which might have you know 400 households pass, that's 50% of the homes, you're likely going to be doing it in the homes anyway. Great, thanks, John. Uh, we're right at our time, so before we get into any more questions, like I said, we'll uh, we'll direct them to the individual uh, panel speakers, and we'll make sure that uh, that uh, we respond back. I think it was a a great 
uh, presentation, started with an overall overview of fixed mobile uh, convergence and, and what's happening around the world, uh, broke it down into some of the component technology solutions that are required uh, to enable it, uh, talked about uh, more specifically small cell traffic engineering uh, and DOCSIS timing protocol to, to sync uh, small cell infrastructure and coordinate it across the DOCSIS platform, and then some practical implementation considerations from Bill. Thought it was an excellent uh, set of perspectives. I think this is truly important for, for cable to consider as we move forward. Uh, I do think it's inevitable that we will have fixed mobile convergence over time, and it's, and it's proper and appropriate to really start uh, thinking through uh, what are some of the technology and practical implications to making that an outcome. I want to thank all of my panelists. I thought it was an excellent group. Uh, their white papers are really good. I would encourage you all to read them, uh, and I appreciate all the time. Back to SCT at this time. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for coming.